Welcome, everybody. Welcome, and please be seated. I'm Susan Collins, the Joan and Sanford Wild Dean of the Gerald R. Ford School of Public Policy. It was truly a pleasure to meet so many of you at our graduation open house yesterday, and it's really an honor to welcome you here to Rackham Auditorium this afternoon for our 2017 commencement ceremony. I'll begin by introducing the members of the platform party. With me on stage is our keynote commencement speaker, the president of the Russell Sage Foundation, and formerly a longtime Ford School faculty member and distinguished university professor, Sheldon Danziger. Sheldon, we're honored to have you here with us today, and we look forward to your remarks a little later in the program. To Sheldon's right is Annie Maxwell, MPP class of 2002, now president of the Skull Global Threats Fund, and this morning at Michigan Stadium, Annie was celebrated as one of just 10 recipients of the university's Bicentennial Alumni Award. Annie, we're so proud of you and we're really happy that you are here with us to celebrate this evening. Next is Paul Courant, the University of Michigan's Interim Provost and Executive Vice President for Academic Affairs. And it is our great fortune to count Paul as among the Ford School's own faculty. Thanks for being here, Paul. At stage right is our writing instructor, David Morse, who will be reading the names of our graduates as they cross the stage a little bit later. We're joined as well. We're joined as well by our two associate deans, Paula Lance and Elizabeth Gerber, and by Jonathan Hansen, who has been elected by our graduating students to deliver the faculty address. And I'll have say, more to say about each of them in a few moments. And last but not least, elected by their respective classmates to provide the student commencement addresses are soon-to-be Ford School MPP graduate Bilal Baidun. <laughs> and BA graduate Joseph Shea. Well, we're gathered here this evening for what has become the happy highlight of the academic year for me and many of our faculty and staff, the opportunity to celebrate the achievements of the wonderful faces who are sitting among us in caps and gowns. The Ford School at the University of Michigan has pioneered the study of public policy for over 100 years. We were the first program of its kind at our founding in 1914. So we've been at this for quite some time. But like, unlike, I should say, my colleagues who, for example, lead the law school or the business school or the school of education, I'm often asked questions like, so what is a school of public policy anyway? Well, I'm always delighted to take any chance I can to tell families and friends about the Ford School, our students, and our faculty. At its core, the Ford School's mission is to improve lives, to improve communities. Public policy is about the institutions and the structures that we build together, that connect us together as neighborhoods, nations, a global community. We can see that public policy from 10, 30, 100 years ago helped to shape the lives that we lead today. Public policy was instrumental in pulling America out of the Great Depression, in rebuilding Europe after 1946, in radically reducing disease, providing safe food, and expanding civil and human rights. Public policy provides the infrastructure around which countries agree to trade, to partner for security, and to implement large-scale environmental protections. Undertakings like these take time, collaboration, and diverse perspectives. They were and are actions rooted in the simple principle of decency. And yet, let's be clear, it was also public policy at work throughout the past year as we slogged through what was one of the most divisive presidential elections which, with perhaps the least amount of policy substance in American history. 
It is also public policy at work just down the road in Flint, Michigan, where a generation will suffer devastating permanent health impacts of lead poisoning from drinking water that they had every reason to expect was safe. Extreme partisanship, growing economic inequality, fake news, all of that, too, is the public policy context that we face. And I think this helps explain why, since last November's election, I have had dozens of people from different backgrounds and in different contexts approach me, the dean of the Ford School, and say something like, we need more Gerald Fords. I really admired President Ford. His decency, his decades of success in working across the aisle, his commitment to an inclusive society, and his fervent belief in bringing facts to bear on public problems President Ford was a tremendous role model. The University of Michigan's bicentennial celebrations called to mind that our namesake president was in office in 1976 as the United States marked its 200th birthday. On July 4, 1976, Ford delivered bicentennial remarks at Valley Forge, the site of great suffering for America's Revolutionary Army 200 some years before. While President Ford, of course, was talking about the United States, I think his words are much more universally true. He stressed, and I quote, a nation survives only so long as the spirit of sacrifice and self-discipline is strong within its people, and that freedom is always worth fighting for. Well, students, I won't trivialize the icy winter suffering of General Washington's army by comparing it to your time in public policy 320 or 510 or economics core, but you have sacrificed and shown discipline and worked hard here at Michigan. And because of that, you are truly prepared to fight for principles that you hold dear, to keep building a more fair, just, and peaceful world. We've taught you to analyze complicated data sets, to evaluate benefits and costs, to speak and write clearly and persuasively, to think critically, ethically, compassionately, to recognize and incorporate multiple perspectives, to craft and enact creative solutions where others might see only dead ends. These tools are becoming all the more relevant as technology and demography propel dramatic breakneck changes in society. We can all see and feel our world becoming smaller and more and more interconnected, our challenges becoming more complex and our problems more wicked. On a happy commencement day, it doesn't take an optimist like me to see that the solution to these problems, our bright hope for the future, is right here. It's among our Ford School students and our alumni. We've prepared these graduates to build careers that represent the very best of the field of public policy. I first stood on this stage for our commencement ceremony in 2008. And just nine years later, the graduates who shook our hands that day have already forged careers of impact. Alums from the class of 2008 are directing public affairs efforts for Coca-Cola and Google. They're leading USAID's anti-malaria initiative, serving as chief of staff for the New Orleans City Council, managing clean energy strategy for Pacific Gas and Electric, and much, much more. Those sorts of careers are in your futures as well. The talented, courageous people working with others to solve society's big problems for the next half century, that's the group that you are now joining as an alum of the Ford School. I speak with confidence when I tell you graduates that the faculty and staff of the Ford School are proud of you and proud of the role that we've played in preparing you for your careers. I've often thought that we who teach and work at the Ford School are privileged in the sense that every day we get to help prepare students like you to become the citizens and the public servants that our world deserves and so desperately needs. So let me speak for a moment about the world-class faculty and outstanding staff who do that work. Our faculty hold joint appointments ranging from economics, political science, sociology, math, and history, to business, law, social work, education, natural resources, information, and urban planning. So their expertise at the Ford School is both broad and deep. They're thoughtful, enthusiastic teachers and mentors, and they're actively engaged with critically important public policy challenges. To give two examples from right here on the stage, Liz Gerber is our Associate Dean for Research and Policy Engagement. 
Her recent work has included game-changing involvement in developing a regional transit authority that is already helping to improve public transportation options for Metro Detroit residents. Paula Lance is our Associate Dean for Academic Affairs. She has dedicated her career to improving population health and reducing health disparities. She's currently leading a major effort to provide timely, actionable policy research that will accelerate progress towards health equity. The Ford School's professional staff are also a fabulous source of the school's strength. Today's graduates have been recruited, counseled, and prepared for their careers by the work of our terrific staff team, a team that keeps the education, research, public service, and engagement missions of the school moving forward. And it is now my pleasure, and indeed my honor, to invite all of the Ford School's faculty and staff to stand. So you all are way ahead of me. Thank you for joining me and thanking them for the tremendous work that they do. Speaking of people who deserve thanks, our audience includes over 800 family members and friends, along with perhaps 400 others who are tuned in to our live web stream. Graduates, please take this chance to thank your loved ones for their support over the years, and our thanks as well. And now I'd like to talk to you about the classes of 2017, about what they've accomplished and given back during your time at the Ford School. We have one PhD graduate who will receive her doctoral hood here this evening from her faculty advisor. And you'll hear her dissertation title as she's hooded. She has done outstanding work, and she leaves the Ford School to join the Peking University faculty as an assistant professor. 91 students receive a master's degree tonight. They hail from eight different countries, and they speak an astounding 23 languages. They include a Boren Fellow, a Winston Health Policy Fellow, and the recently named Michigan Difference Graduate Student of the Year. <laughs> this year, they raised over $13,000 for the Community Foundation of Greater Flint, and they did so with tremendous creativity. Many of us especially enjoyed the Top Chef tasting events. Thank you very much. They were delicious. Um, last year, this cohort was the driving force behind a new group for first-generation college students. They organized lunches, created a newsletter, and found many ways to connect and support each other here at this very large university. I recently heard a staff member describe this MPP class with one word, rambunctious. Well, I actually think that's a fine way to start a career in public policy. So, have they always mingled and collaborated well with our undergraduates? <laughs> well, um, commencement seems as good a time as any to really start that tradition. And so, I'd like to invite Joe and Bilal to maybe demonstrate with a special, oh, a hug even better. <laughs> Perfect. And just to remind our MPP students, you might be working for one of the BAs one day. <laughs> and they may be working for you. So, so now let me tell you about the, tw the 73 students who graduate today with a Bachelor of Arts in Public Policy. They have, been one of the they have been part of one of the university's finest liberal arts programs. In small classes with some of the universities of Michigan's top faculty, our BA curriculum trains students to think critically and across disciplines to understand policy challenges and develop solutions. I must note that the BAs first joined the Ford School 10 years ago, which was my first year as dean, and it has been such a pleasure to watch the program take off. Today's BA, BA graduates include 23 Phi Beta Kappa, 26 Angel Scholars, and two recipients of the Martin Luther King Jr. Spirit Award. They write for the Daily, they lead campus-wide student government. They advocate passionately and wisely for the causes they believe in. These students truly are the leaders and best across a wide array of campus activities. Taken together, the classes of 2017 are serious students, hard workers, and dedicated leaders. 
They have changed this place for the better, volunteering in large numbers and in so many different ways, welcoming incoming classes, serving on school committees, leading student organizations, supporting our public lecture series, and more. The classes of 2017 have been at the Ford School and the university during a time of increased focus on diversity, equity, and inclusion. In fact, these students have actively led the way. They've chaired and participated on campus-wide initiatives, and here at the Ford School, they've led diversity summits and community conversations. They've worked hard in the classroom to both speak and listen with respect for differences of all sorts. And so, to all of our graduates, I say on behalf of the Ford School, thank you. It has truly been a pleasure to work with you and to get to know you. I know that many of you have mixed feelings about what today represents. You'll miss a lot about your days in Ann Arbor. Dominic's, the Diag, Dancing at Live, Rick's, Skeeps, <laughs> Charlie's. You'll miss long working hours in the computer lab, urgent emails to FSPP all, Jim Harbaugh's third season. Of course, most of all, you'll miss your Ford fam. Next year, your friends and classmates may not be just down the street, but I promise you that the ties you've made here, the ties that you forged in shared struggles and shared values, will endure and will help sustain you. On July 5th, 1976, President Ford made bicentennial remarks during a naturalization ceremony at Monticello. He said to the crowd of immigrants, soon to be American citizens, remember that the more freedom you give to others, the more you will have for yourself. Remember that without law there can be no liberty, and remember as well the rich treasures you brought from whence you came, and let us share your pride in them. As an immigrant myself, those words particularly resonate with me as I reflect back in the 10th and final year of my deanship. Indeed, my parents, both from Jamaica, exemplified the values of perseverance in helping others. They inspired me on the path that led to this unique place, the small but mighty Ford School. Its reach and its impact are immensely enriched by the many treasures that its faculty, staff, students, and alumni that each of you have brought to its very special community. It has been a tremendous honor for me to have become part of this Ford fam, and for all of the good, indeed, I would say great work that we have done together in the past 10 years, my heartfelt thank you. I like how Oprah Winfrey put things when she said, and I quote, if you hadn't been prepared when the opportunity came along, you wouldn't have been lucky. It might not always seem so, but as Hamilton's Angelica Schuyler sings, how lucky we are to be alive right now. Well, to that I'll add now, when our world and our community so clearly need your talents, how well prepared you all are to serve and lead, to seize the opportunities that will present themselves. Graduates, we are so proud of you, Congratulations and best wishes to the classes of 2017. Go Blue! Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Thank you. And now it is my great pleasure to introduce my longtime colleague and my current boss, Paul Courant. <laughs> In addition to his role as Provost and Executive Vice President for Academic Affairs, Paul is an Arthur Thurnau Professor, the Harold T. Shapiro Collegiate Professor of Public Policy, Professor of Economics, Professor of Information, Presidential Bicentennial Professor, and Faculty Associate in the Institute for Social Research. His wit and his warmth are legendary. 
We speak often of the wonderful community at the Ford School. As a longtime faculty member and former director of the school, Paul is among those who created that special culture that we treasure and who helped to sustain it over all of the years. Please join me in welcoming to the podium Provost Paul Courant. Thank you, Susan. Um, as interim provost, I'm here in part to represent the university at this ceremony. And as a faculty member at the Ford School, I get a bonus opportunity to congratulate our graduates from that perspective. So if I can count right, congratulations, class of 2017. Congratulations, class of 2017. <laughs> the Ford School is a wonderful microcosm of the University of Michigan. It's diverse in many ways while being united in its commitment to intellectual rigor and creative thinking. It's a place where students work hard together and develop lasting friendships, as Susan was, was talking about. You have in your time here contributed to this community, and I trust that you've come to appreciate the foundation it gives you. We're confident that it will stand you in good stead as you move on to live and work in communities throughout the world. When you came to the Ford School, you brought with you intelligence, curiosity, and a commitment to the common good. We have, as a school, added to your knowledge and helped you develop skills that will prove useful as you seek to affect public policy in your careers and as active citizens. And we've taught you several arcane vocabularies that you can use to amaze and delight your families and friends. <laughs> You've taught us a few things as well to listen carefully, to think imaginatively, to laugh at ourselves, and to remember the deeply held beliefs that led us to public policy in the first place. You've shared your experiences and your convictions with us, and we are grateful for the opportunities you gave us to learn. That faculty learn from students is one of the best things about universities in general, and about the Ford School in particular. As you leave the Ford School for the policy world, you enter an arena where the problems you will address are complex and challenging. In choosing this field, you've committed yourselves to work that is hard, underappreciated, and critical to our shared future. This work requires a strong commitment to careful analysis, robust debate, and thoughtful decision making, and a willingness to accept the fact that some people make more money than you do. Since its founding in 1914 as the Institute for Public Administration, the school has been a leader in providing rigorous training for careers in public service. In today's world, the need for clear-eyed analysis, evidence-based decision-making, and commitment to the common good is considerable. Partisan news sites reinforce the well-documented, in part well-documented by Ford School faculty, human tendency to search for evidence and evaluate evidence in a way that favors one's initial belief. The immediacy and brevity of some forms of social media encourage communication without reflection and the distribution of content that lacks complexity and nuance. At the same time, increases in partisanship, sometimes hyper-partisanship, have deprived us of useful examples of debate and, deliber and deliberation. Harold Shapiro, who served as president of the University of Michigan and of Princeton University, and who was a member of the Ford School faculty in the 1980s, made the observation that the university must be both a servant and critic of society, a combination of characteristics that can be difficult to practice. Not everyone so much loves and trusts their critics. The same combination applies to those who seek to improve policy on behalf of society. Once one serves and is critic, and indeed serves in part by being a critic. The service and the criticism, in turn, require deep knowledge of how the world works and the kind of knowledge that is often developed in universities but all too rarely used. And that's where you come in. The world is in need of what you are very well prepared to do. Your commitment to the thoughtful exploration and compassionate resolution of human problems represents our best hope for the future. So to the graduates, let me say that with pride in your accomplishments and confidence in your abilities, we welcome you to the community of University of Michigan graduates and look forward to your contributions to the world. 
congratulations, and congratulations. As noted earlier, I'm also wearing an administrative hat. With that firmly in place, I want to salute Susan Collins as she presides over her final commencement as Dean of the Ford School. Wait, there's more. <laughs> in her 10 years as Dean, Susan has led the school to new levels of accomplishment. She's made the school and its expertise more visible to policymakers around the country and around the world. Faculty members are regularly consulted by officials at all levels of government and contribute to national and international policy debates through op-eds, upshots, podcasts, blogs, and other media. She's worked with imagination and energy to bring practitioners to the school, enriching the curriculum with these voices of experience. Susan's first concern, however, has always been to ensure that Ford School students receive an education that will make them leaders and best throughout their careers. Attentive to the needs of students at all levels, Susan has worked tirelessly to ensure that students have the academic training, interpersonal support, and financial resources that they need to succeed. The Ford School has a decades-long history as a caring community. Susan has sustained and strengthened that tradition while overseeing growth in the program. To 40s and Ipsters alike, these are important gifts to a place that they love. While Susan is stepping down as dean, she will continue to be a member of the faculty. She will hold the Edward M. Gramlich Collegiate Professorship of Public Policy. The naming of this chair pays tribute to the school's founding dean, who was, like Susan, deeply committed to the common good. Susan, we are grateful for and better because of your contributions to the Ford School, the University of Michigan, and the society we all live in. Thank you. Wow, thank you so much. Again, I am overwhelmed, and it, again, is such an honor to be a part of this very special community. And thank you for your remarks, Paul. Now, to move on, I would like to introduce our keynote commencement speaker, Sheldon Danziger. Sheldon is the president of the Russell Sage Foundation, the principal American foundation devoted exclusively to research in the social sciences. Sheldon is one of the nation's leading scholars on the causes and consequences of poverty and inequality. He was also on the Ford School faculty for many years and recognized with the university's highest honor as a distinguished university professor. And yet for all of Sheldon's renown as a scholar, his career as a teacher and a mentor are just as central to his legacy. For 25 years, he led pre- and postdoctoral training programs here at, at Michigan that were designed in part to bring much-needed diversity of backgrounds and disciplines to the study of poverty and social welfare. Those former students are now successful faculty leaders themselves, training and inspiring their own students at colleges and universities around the world. Others are employed at foundations, think tanks, research fund, uh, firms, nonprofits, and government agencies. When Sheldon retired from our faculty a few years ago to take his post at Russell Sage, dozens of his former students eagerly planned and participated in a major symposium in his honor. And when I looked around the room that day, it was clear that Sheldon's commitment to mentorship and teaching had changed the face of poverty research for generations to come. Please join me in welcoming to the podium Russell Sage President Sheldon Danziger. Thank you, Dean Collins, for uh, your kind introduction. Uh, it's wonderful being back at Rackham with uh, Provost Courant and my former colleagues, uh, faculty and staff. Um, I'm particularly honored because I think I was here for uh, Susan's first six um, uh, Ford School graduations in it, so it's particularly uh, appropriate that I'm here for your last one. Um, as I heard her remarks, I thought, 
gosh, she's got some of the same things in her talk that I have in mind, but she's, <laughs> she's so much better at getting it across. So I'm going to talk today about uh, why the evidence-based, nonpartisan public policy analysis that's a hallmark of the Ford School education is more important now than it has ever been uh, in my career. Uh, I want to start and congratulate the graduates only once. Paul did it twice. Uh, but the BAs, uh, the MPAs, the MPPs, and the PhDs. And I know how special this day uh, is to the students because I, I taught here for 25 years. And um, I know uh, that uh, you're relieved that you no longer have exams and papers. Uh, but I also know uh, that you're proud of your accomplishments, but that the proudest people here are your parents, grandparents, relatives, and friends. And I know your parents are particularly delighted that they won't get another Michigan tuition bill. <laughs> uh, the Ford School faculty and staff uh, are, uh, as has been said, but I'll say it again, are remarkable people. Uh, I know the faculty not only spend time uh, in the classroom, but also outside mentoring students. And I certainly know about the long hours the writing instructor and career services offices and the other Ford School staff uh, focus attention on Ford School students. I, I, I know that uh, you as Ford School students get much more attention uh, than do students in other programs on campus and almost uh, anywhere else. Uh, in the country. So um, uh, again, as Susan said, one of the highlights of my career here is to look back and see many of the students I taught in leading positions at universities, uh, think tanks, government agencies, and in the nonprofit and private sectors. So to turn to my remarks, uh, and it builds on some of the things Paul said, is that at the Ford School, rigorous policy analysis is the order of the day. Uh, students learn, I, I have three things, they learn other things, but uh, three key things uh, that are emphasized. First, all public policies have costs and benefits, some intended, others not intended, and it's difficult uh, to sort them all out. And uh, one of the things you learn is to how to start the process of doing that. You also learn that private markets sometimes fail, uh, and that sometimes those outcomes can be improved by government interventions. You also learn that sometimes government interventions fail and they can be improved uh, by private sector options. But the key lesson is that evidence matters, that you can't make good policy choices by invoking theories or ideologies or alternative facts, that Almost all policy changes have winners and losers, uh, and you can't pretend otherwise. Uh, in other words, there are no magic bullets. So I want to give you an example uh, of how public policy has evolved in the poverty area, uh, an area that has been contentious for many years, and suggest how uh, a Ford School education uh, can help you uh, think about moving forward. So I'll start in 1964 with a quote from President Johnson when he uh, launched the War on Poverty. He said, we cannot and need not wait for the gradual growth of the economy to lift this forgotten fifth of our nation above the poverty line. We know what must be done, and this nation of abundance can surely afford to do it. Shortly thereafter, his administration launched and implemented major efforts that it's hard to think of our world today without them. Uh, Medicare, Medicaid, Head Start, Job Corps, grants for college tuition, safety net protections for the poor, food stamps, increased minimum wage, increased social security benefits. Each year, millions, tens of millions of low-income, elderly and disabled Americans benefit from these and other social policy programs. There's a long 
tradition of research, which continues to evolve, that emphasizes that these programs deliver significant benefits to those who receive them. They reduce poverty and economic hardship in the short run, and they improve the education and health outcomes of their children in the long run. Despite the research, a view remains widely held, um, best exemplified by a simple sentence from Ronald Reagan in the 1980s, quote, the federal government fought the war on poverty and poverty won. But if the research evidence says that the safety net works, but the conventional wisdom doesn't accept that evidence, why is it that poverty remains high? The simple answer is that it's the economy that's changed. And the economy changed drastically in the 1970s uh, so that a rising tide no longer lifts all boats. We're living in an era of inequality where um, economic growth no longer trickles down to the poor or even to the middle class because most of the economic gains of the last 30 years have been captured by the economic elite. There are a lot of causes of this, also a long research. Globalization, labor-saving technological changes, declining unions, and changing corporate employment practices have all combined to hold down the wages for workers without a, quality, without a college degree. However, even though the effects of these complex economic, social, and political changes are evident in the research, Politicians continue to claim that magic bullets exist, that they'll increase economic growth and lift all boats again. The magic often involves such things as reducing taxes on the rich and reducing government spending uh, for the poor and the middle class. Uh, some people have even claimed that tax cuts will unleash huge economic growth that will pay for itself. I'll give two recent examples. Uh, the recent attempt to repeal and replace the Affordable Care Act, uh, the research analysis of the Congressional Budget Office uh, and other nonpartisan uh, organizations show that the American Health Care Act of 2017 uh, would have had uh, more than half of the tax cuts go to families with incomes over a million dollars. And the Congressional Budget Office estimated that within a decade, 24 million fewer Americans would have health insurance. That doesn't sound to me like a policy in which a rising tide will lift all boats. Just this Wednesday, uh, the new administration uh, 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 put out a one-page proposal uh, of more than $5 trillion in tax cuts. Uh, a um, group called um, the Committee for a Responsible Fed Federal Budget, uh, which includes uh, former uh, government leaders and senators from both political parties, wrote, uh, it seems as if the administration is using economic growth like magic beans the solution to all of our problems. But there is no golden goose at the top of the tax beanstalk, just mountains of debt. The Ford School, as I said, teaches students to reject magic bullets and evaluate the evidence. This may be a pipe dream in today's political environment, but you're just starting your career. Uh, and as Susan said, uh, it's now uh, more important than ever uh, to take up the challenge uh, of your Ford School education. Let me uh, suggest uh, a recent example of where I used my Ford School education uh, to try to do something like this in the public arena. A few years ago, I was invited to join a nonpartisan task force, which was convened by the right of center American Enterprise Institute and the left of center Brookings Institution. When we joined, we were asked to take a pledge. Quote, we understand that the need to compromise and work together means that the final report is unlikely to be entirely acceptable to anyone. It wasn't easy. 
Uh, when we first started meeting, uh, we argued and interrupted each other. We were fortunate that a psychologist was leading the group. Uh, and uh, one of the things he did was always have us start at lunch and work through dinner. And at about five o'clock, he brought out the scotch and the wine. <laughs> and while people were getting their dinner, they talked about their families. And, and it, it, it actually uh, got to the point where, even though we disagreed, we liked each other. Uh, we issued a report called Opportunity, Responsibility, and Security. You can go to the website of either AEI or Brookings and take a look at it. We began to move forward when all of us agreed that there were three shared values that people on both sides of the political divide uh, could endorse. And we were going to use those values then to uh, look at the evidence and come up with our policy responses. The first was non-controversial, nobody disagreed. I suspect nobody in the room would disagree. Quote, all Americans should have the opportunity to apply their talents and efforts to better themselves and their children, regardless of the circumstances of their birth. The second, we all agreed, but it was the one that was the most important to the conservative members. Quote, all Americans have a responsibility to provide for themselves and their families to the best of their abilities before asking others for help. The third was more important to the progressives. Quote, all Americans are entitled to a basic level of security against the vicissitudes of life and in a nation as rich as ours to a baseline level of material well-being. That echoes the Johnson statement that I read to start. We ended up concluding that we had to both promote personal responsibility and to ensure that individuals would be able to take that responsibility by having jobs available. Uh, again, the report says, we can't assume that enough jobs are always available for those who need them, especially for the hard to employ, those facing barriers to work, those who lived in depressed regions of the country, such as rural areas, and during economic uh, downturns. None of us would have come up with the recommendations on their own. There are many other recommendations on family policy changes, education policy changes. Uh, you wouldn't want me to spend more time and go through all of those, I know. Um, the conservatives preferred a greater emphasis on the poor taking personal responsibility. Uh, progressives preferred a greater emphasis on raising the earnings of poor and income workers, uh, low income workers. We felt that if you could take a secret vote in Congress, you would get more than 60% of Republicans and Democrats to agree on our conclusions the way we had come together, the way Susan uh, uh, remarked that President Ford was famous for working across the aisle. Unfortunately, such willingness to compromise is rare today, um, and at one time it was business as usual, but that's what a Ford School education uh, teaches you to do. Careful policy analysis and thoughtful dialogue are what represent uh, a Ford School education. So again, like Susan, I want to encourage you uh, to go out and pursue uh, rigorous research, uh, to document domestic and international policy issues that are ripe for change, and to think about all the costs and benefits of the various solutions. Uh, we, who are uh, in the uh, closing uh, decades of our public policy careers, need you to take up the challenge for the next decades. We need you to engage in and contribute to rational and civil dialogue in public and public and private realms, to write about these issues uh, in the media, including social media. Social media doesn't have to emphasize alternative facts. Ford School students can uh, blog about real facts. Uh, to get involved in your community, to participate in politics, uh, and even run for elective office. Uh, it would be nice uh, 
to come back in the future to a Ford School graduation and find out that the University of Michigan uh, had a second president who was a Michigan alum. Uh, because of what you've accomplished at the Ford School, I'm confident that you are ready uh, for the task of taking up these grand challenges. So once again, congratulations to the graduates, their parents, relatives, and friends. I'm honored to have the uh, opportunity to address you today. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sheldon. And now I am delighted to welcome to the stage members of one of the University of Michigan's outstanding a cappella ensembles. They will perform two classics from the University of Michigan songbook for us, the Dicks and Janes. Thank you very much. 
Each year, the Ford School's graduating students are asked to elect people to play key roles at commencement, and one faculty member is chosen to speak to the class. Both sets of graduating uh, students also choose a representative student speaker. As the faculty speaker this year, the classes of 2017 elected Jonathan Hansen. John Hansen is a lecturer in statistics for public policy at the Ford School. He is a specialist in comparative political economy and political development. In his recent projects, he has explored whether democracy and state capacity complement or substitute for each other in terms of improving human development, and why authoritarian regimes vary so significantly in terms of economic and social outcomes. John holds an MA in economics and a PhD in political science from the University of Michigan. And John, or at least John's chin, was a top fundraiser during our students' No Shave November, <laughs> which raised money for the Flint Child and Health Development Fund. And so I'm delighted now to welcome him on behalf of the faculty to address our graduates. John? What do you do with a tassel when you speak? <laughs> Class of 2017, you look good, you look good. <laughs> so congratulations, you've made it. A lot of long hours, a lot of problem sets, policy memos, a few exams here and there. I may have been responsible for some of those. <laughs> but you got here, you made it. It's time to sit back and savor the moment for a while and appreciate what you've done. So congratulations. It's a big honor for me uh, to be chosen to represent the faculty and speak to you today. And I have to say that this class of MPP students will be one that I always remember because we started together in the fall of 2016. Um, for you, it was the start of a two-year adventure as a public policy student. And for me, it was a return to the University of Michigan, a place that I love as a student, um, but would need to find a new home in the School of Public Policy as a member of the faculty. Um, I don't know who was more excited at the time, you or me, but I think it was me. <laughs> yes. um, but like you, I had to go through a process of acclimation. I had to get my bearings, meet new colleagues, and just really figure out how the school worked. And one of the things I most needed to figure out was what you would be like. Um, I've been teaching for many years. I've taught hundreds and hundreds of undergraduates in my lecture courses, lots of doctoral students in my PhD seminars, um, but only a smattering of master students had ever come through my classroom. And so I had to wonder, what would it be like to stand in front of a lecture hall full of you? And what I found is that it was a fantastic teaching experience um, because the uh, talents that you bring, the experiences that you've had, and the passion you bring for bringing change to the world, and the genuine desire for learning, even when the classes might not always be so fun, like my stats class, for instance. <laughs> but you worked hard, and you worked through all the difficult times, and we got here today. What more could I ask for, after all, when I tell a bunch of dorky jokes, and you guys laugh? <laughs> See? <laughs> and as you know, the community here is something special. Um, we worked hard to create a place that is open and accessible and diverse and where we appreciate each other. And you really are at the core of that, you the students. Um, but you're about to join a larger community out there, the community of alumni of the Ford School of Public Policy who are out there making a difference in the world. Um, we will miss you, but we look forward to seeing what you do when you take all of this energy and passion and go out there and change things. We're looking forward to it. And now, more than ever, we need you. We badly need well-trained, skilled people to be in positions of influence uh, to address the challenges that we face today. I'm repeating a little bit what you may have heard before, but I think we're all ruminating about the same things that are happening in the world today. For we know that in America we're facing a time of challenges. 
where the policymaking process is beset by simplistic beliefs or ideological fights, rather than the kind of evidence-based rigorous analysis that we prize so highly here. We see fake news and trivialities dominating the political discourse, and there's a growing distrust of experts. Instead of taking the scientific consensus around issues like climate change at face value, for example, we make them issues of ideological faith. People create different realities, and because of that, they find it hard to compromise with each other when the time comes. So in these times, you could be forgiven for wondering what is the value of all the training that you've had here. If ideology can substitute for evidence, what good is it to bring evidence to bear on just public policy decision makings? But the fact of the matter is that the kind of training we've had here now is, ne is now more important than it's ever been before. We should serve as a model for how to have a reasonable political dialogue and how to use analytic tools to bring decisions based on evidence. We also have a crucial role in promoting values, the kind of community that we have here at Ford where we work hard to respect diversity in its many forms is exactly the model that we need to restore the frame fabric of the American community. We have our differences, sure, but we come together, we listen to each other, and we work for the common good. We now need you to be the leaders and the best and to take on these challenges and change the world out there. And I must say the situation is not as bleak as it seems. There's some evidence, if you look hard enough, of the impact of experts out there having an effect on the public policy process. As Sheldon Danziger mentioned, the Congressional Budget Office, staffed with people just like you, had a big impact on the recent debate over health care policy. They did analysis and said what they predicted would happen, and it changed the course of the debate in the House of Representatives. And we've also seen what happened when community organizers and medical professionals and university researchers and, uh, looked at the situation in Flint, and they stood their ground, and they made people pay attention. We have to stand up when you know what's right. And then we heard our president not the president here, but of the United States, remarked recently about the health care debate that, you know, it was a lot more complicated than he first thought. <laughs> Who knew it could be so complicated? <laughs> you guys knew because you study these things, right? You knew. It turns out that expertise matters. Your skills your passion, and the values that you bring matter. So don't be discouraged by the divisiveness of our political discourse. In the end, people can be persuaded by evidence. Still, I want to warn you that at some time and some place, you may fail. You may put your heart and your soul into something, and it may not turn out just how you think. But if you stay true to your values, you can never really fail. If you can look yourself at the mirror in the morning and say, I did it the right way, it doesn't matter what the critics say because you met the standard that matters. So when things are rough, remember that. You don't back down. You get back up again. You dust yourself off, and you keep going. There is always another opportunity at another place at another time. So public policy students of 2017, great challenges, but great opportunities lie ahead. You're ready to face them. I know it. We congratulate you. We are proud of you. And we want to hear from you. Oh, and one more thing. Wherever you are, wherever you go, go blue. <laughs>
counseling other BA students on their coursework and providing input to faculty and student, uh, uh, faculty and administrators. He has secured a position as a junior asso associate at Sugarman Communications Group in LA, um, which is an LA-based public affairs and corporate communications consulting firm. Joe's father and his godfather are both proud Ford School alumni class of 1985, so that's a wonderful legacy. And he's been described by staff as, and I quote, the ultimate Ford School cheerleader. <laughs> and so it's really a pleasure to welcome Joe Shea now to address his, the graduates. Thank you. Thanks, Bilal. And thank you, Dean Collins. Um, so last year, in my Ford School course on political campaign strategy, my professor, Rusty Hills, told our class that we should always open a speech by either thanking someone or telling a joke. So I'd like to thank all of the speakers who have come before me and offered a joke. But really, uh, distinguished guests, faculty, <laughs> that's all I got. Distinguished, <laughs> distinguished guests, faculty, staff, family, friends, and my beloved classmates at the undergraduate and graduate level, good afternoon. It's an honor to be here with you today as we truly have so much to celebrate. In fact, my cohort has been celebrating this milestone for the past month. <laughs> through barbecues, bar crawls, and gatherings at local eateries. I think it's telling that so many of us have chosen to spend our final days in college together because it shows that the Ford School is just as much a community as it is an academic institution. At some point along this transformative educational experience, we became more like a family than simply a collection of students interested in policy. And I can't tell you for sure when this happened. Maybe it was the early mornings during Professor Chorchari's class where we discussed topics that ranged from the grand bargain in Detroit to the effect of the poppy trade on Afghanistan's economy. Or maybe it was the late nights in the Betty Ford Auditorium, putting the finishing touches on, or perhaps just starting, our policy memos due the following morning. <laughs> Regardless, what I can tell you is that getting to know the 74 individuals seated in front of me has been one of the greatest blessings of my life. Simply put, our cohort is full of change makers. From Emma Zorfis, who designed a program to educate Michigan students on how to recognize sexual misconduct and intervene to Meredith Joseph and Gabe Dell, <laughs> who traveled to the United Nations in order to advocate on behalf of refugees. These individuals, along with so many others, inspire me every day with their compassion, intellect, and dynamism. And it's this inspiration from my classmates that, when combined with the guidance that I've received from Ford's incredible faculty, has given me this gift of an enduring faith in the practice of public policy to make a positive, lasting impact. Now, those of us with this faith in the potential of policymaking also know that at some point, this faith will surely be tested. Just last week, I was reminded of the frustratingly nonlinear process of public policy formulation while talking to Dr. Joe Schwartz a former member of Congress and current Ford School professor. Dr. Schwartz told me that one of his proudest moments on the Hill was when he passionately advocated for two bills that were never actually signed into law. Both were aimed at increasing the federal government's investment in embryonic stem cell research. As a medical doctor, Dr. Schwartz fought hard for these bills because he believed in the potential of, his research, of this research to discover breakthrough treatments and fighting deadly diseases. However, each bill passed the House, then the Senate, only to be vetoed at the desk of the President. It wasn't until Dr. Schwartz was out of office four years later 
that a new White House administration issued an executive order that increased federal investment in embryonic stem cell research. But Dr. Schwartz's two pieces of legislation played a role. Each served as a litmus test of the political feasibility um, to, uh, ultimately indicating that this executive order could withstand congressional scrutiny. To me, stories like this demonstrate that it's necessary to have a deeply rooted faith in policymaking in order to withstand the inevitable setbacks and the potential slow, slow rate of change. This story also reinforces the idea that hope can be found in efforts to create thoughtful policy regardless of the outcome. A quote I love is from Mother Teresa, who says that we are not called to be successful, but faithful. I would argue that in policymaking, success is based on faith in the process of it. So class of 2017, as we prepare to take on the world, I hope that you will join me in continuing to embrace this faith in the potential of public policy, and I can think of no better way to honor the incredible individuals in this Ford School community, this Ford family of ours. And I want to end by saying, on behalf of my class, undergraduate and graduate, to all the parents out there, including my own, who are responsible for making this day possible, thank you. You have given us the world. And to everyone at the Ford School, from Dean Collins to the student services and building maintenance staff, thank you. You have empowered us to find our place in it. Thank you, and go blue. Thank you very much, Joe. The MPP and MPA class of 2017 elected Bilal Baidun to speak on their behalf. Bilal earned a bachelor's degree in history from the University of Michigan with high honors. The son of Lebanese immigrants and a first-generation college student himself, Bilal has done volunteer work for years to broaden access for others giving presentations on financial aid and the college admissions process to young people in his hometown of Dearborn, Michigan. Here at the Ford School, Bilal was the first recipient of the Gerald R. Ford Presidential Fellowship, a prestigious award established to honor our namesake president and his lifetime of leadership and service. Bilal has been a nonprofit board fellow and a case competition champion. He completed his internship last summer with the Clinton Foundation, producing country reports, economic analyses, and briefing memos in support of the Foundation's global initiatives. Bilal, it is a pleasure to welcome you to the podium. They picked me to go, they picked me to go last because they know how concise my memos are, so. I want to start by congratulating my parents. Um, this will be their second degree from the University of Michigan as well as mine. And um, a special heartfelt thank you to Dean Collins. Uh, it's been a privilege to be a part of the Ford School family uh, under your direction. And of course, a warm spring welcome to all of you. <laughs> um, to the families and especially to the parents, thank you for creating my dear friends and my soon-to-be colleagues and, and I'm deeply sorry we didn't go to law school, but that's just the way it is. <laughs> and finally, to the hiring managers across the country who I hope are joining us via live stream. Um, <laughs> My name is Bilal Beydoun, and I could start on June 1st. <laughs> But most importantly, the reason why we're here, the Ford School of Public Policy, Class of 2017, otherwise known as my fellow graduates. It's great to see you for the first time this semester. <laughs> um, and if I'm being honest, you've aged. <laughs> uh, and that's saying a lot because I saw you the week after the election, but in any case. 
Uh, <laughs> Now, the, the remaining weeks of last November were trying times for me and perhaps for you as well. But on January the 8th, when we came back from our holiday break, uh, I sat in class and before the lecture even started, the professor had projected a quote onto the screen that really struck me, and here's what it said. It said, if your entire understanding of the United States would be different if 90,000 people voted differently, then you have the opportunity to reconsider your understanding of the United States. Prior to reading that, I never really thought the, the word reconsider was, you know, especially empowering. Uh, I mostly used it to email professors who didn't accept late assignments. Um, <laughs> but there's something truly profound and bold and, yes, empowering uh, about, subject, about subjecting your views to further scrutiny after adopting them as your own. The opportunity to reconsider your understanding. For me, this idea captures the essence of being a policy student, especially in 2017. This is what we're trained to do, and this is the unique power we now hold. The ability to cut through popular narratives, distill them using rigorous analysis, and ultimately reshape them for the public's benefit. To take what we do know about the world and use it to discern what we do not know. To constantly, even if begrudgingly, be willing to reconsider. This doesn't just apply to the United States and its elections, but to, to any one of the over 20 countries represented in the Ford student body, from China to Georgia to Chile, and to the global community more broadly. Today, there's no shortage of narratives to consider and reconsider. How do we address global climate change? What's the best way to resettle refugee populations? What is driving the political polarization that everybody's talking about? Is Ohio State University actually accredited? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Welcome to Ann Arbor. <laughs> I, <laughs> I didn't come to a place like the Ford School for someone to give me the answers because some of them don't yet exist. But rather than feel helpless in the flurry of questions, I now feel hopeful that I know where to start that I know which tool to use. And for some of us, that tool is calculus, not for me. No, I'm sorry. <laughs> but there are other tools. Uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with the world of policy schools, uh, the Ford School is truly cutting edge and experimental when it comes to pushing its students to challenge orthodoxy. So for example, some of you might not know that the Ford School offers a full 14 week long course on fly fishing. It's, it, it's called the Politics of Public Policy with Rick Hall. <laughs> I highly recommend it. <laughs> These past two years, we were so fortunate to seize the opportunity to retreat from the world and reconsider that which we hold true. But not everything requires a critical second or third look, and not all that is reconsidered will produce different conclusions. I walked onto this campus believing that immigrants, like my parents, enrich and elevate this country, and I'll never stop believing that, regardless of what anyone says. But I must say, a lot of what I reconsidered in graduate school resulted from the friendships I forged with these incredible people. Class of 2017, you, re you represent the best of us and the best in us. You pushed me and challenged me even when I wasn't there, which was fairly often. <laughs> <laughs> I don't need to tell you about the challenges all around us, only that people around the world, most of whom you'll never know, are relying on you. But I could think of no other group more worthy of that responsibility. Thank you for your love and encouragement, and go blue. Thank you, Bilal. Well, we are now at the moment that family and friends have been looking forward to all evening. And our graduates are certainly ready to come to the stage to receive official congratulations on a job truly well done. This year, the names will be read by David Morse. 
David is a lecturer in expository writing at the Ford School, where he tutors graduate and undergraduate students. David is an outstanding teacher and a talented writer. He has a master's degree in fiction writing from the University of Michigan, and his work has been published widely. His first play was performed at the Colorado Shakespeare Festival in 2010. And I'm pleased now to introduce David to call the names of our graduating students. And I'd also like to invite the members of our platform party to step forward and help to congratulate our graduates. Good evening. To begin, I'll call our graduate earning a Doctor of Philosophy in Public Policy and Sociology. I'd like to welcome Mary Corcoran to the stage. <laughs> Mary is a professor of political science, public policy, social work, and women's studies, and she will hood our first graduate. Iron Leo. Iron's dissertation title is Family SES, Non-Cognitive Skills and Achievement Inequality in Children's Early Life Course. Iron will be taking a position as an assistant professor in the Department of Sociology at Peking University in China. Now we will welcome our graduates receiving a master's degree in public policy or public administration. Ali Abazid. <laughs> Krista Nuardi Aditomo. Yasuhisa Arai. Farhana Naaz Arif. Maha Arshad. Michael Auerbach. Rachel Basil. Raymond Barrett. Bilal Beydoun. <laughs> Alex Berger. Rhonda Bishop. <laughs> Megan Bogarts. Afton Paris Branch. Michael Boudros. <laughs> Ellie Chesson. <laughs> Caitlin Maureen Conway. <laughs> Lindsay Coonan. <laughs> Michael Correa. Therese Empey. <laughs> Catherine Ann Eister. <laughs> Kenny Fennell. <laughs> Joshua Fleming. <laughs> Eduardo Garcia. Armand Gorokian. John Guerrero. Mari Hashimoto. Maureen Higgins. Stephanie Hinchin. 
Maxwell Huntley. Essie Kokua Hutchful. Kosei Ishiwata. <laughs> Kritika Jeraman. Tashana Joseph. Wook Kong. Ethan Kennedy. Jin Wung Kim. Emily Robson Krishunas. Mark Croning. <laughs> Maureen Lochner. <laughs> Emily Lawton. <laughs> Hyun Ho Lee. Terence Lee. <laughs> Kelly Lovett. <laughs> Nishant Malhotra. <laughs> Michael Kevin Dabu Manansala. Farah Ladan Mandich. <laughs> Alexander Reed Mervek. <laughs> Raksha Mishra. <laughs> Benjamin Morse. Kate Naranjo. Daniela Oliva. Melanie Pitkin. Curtis Powell. Emily Premick. Joshua Rivera. Courtney Sanders. Mary Schlitt. Sunder Sharma. Kathleen Sly. Marlo Staples. Kazuki Tanaka. Tom Van Hickey. Nadja Vandergriff. Nicholas Wallace. Molly Welch Marahar. Marissa Wetmore. Bradley Winterstein. Harry Wolberg. <laughs> Yu Chen Yain. <laughs> Cage Yoda.
Robert Yan. And now we welcome to the stage students receiving a Bachelor of Arts in Public Policy, Thomas Allen. Joe Ambrose. Alexa Baglione. Julie Barger. Jessica Bethlehem. James Henry Blattner. Eliza Borish. Laura Brodkin. Neha Butch. Max Boltman. Desiree Chu. Dominic Klolinger. Gabriella D'Agostini. Sarah Dagger. Max Roland Davidson. Gabriel Dell. Zachary Dubin. Aaron Eusebi. Matthew Fidel. Genevieve Friedman. Alexandra George. Lauren Gold. Adele Goldberg. Jacob Haber. Mark Heider. Oliver Harfield. Ian Hecker. James Hendrickson. Thomas Hislop. Noah Lisbon Holton Raphael. Hannah Louise Horobin. Jonathan Hyman. Meredith Joseph. Daniel Carr. Julie Katz Nelson. Ruby Kirby. Isaac Maycock. Pooja Nair. Victoria Noble. Heidi Lynn Pater. Jacob Perlman. Daniel Rabun. Madeline Riley. Madeline Rose. Connor Rubin. Laura Seidman. Swathi Shunmugasantharam. <laughs> Daniel Sharp. <laughs> Joseph Shea. <laughs> Carson Smith. <laughs> India Solomon. <laughs> Graham Steffens. Michael Sugarman. Yeah. 
Kirthana Sundar. Maisie Sylvan. Shahar Steiner. Claire Tegman. Gregory Weinstock. Alexander White. Molly Williams. Mary Kate Wynn. Samantha Wintner. Aaron Woodruff. Emily Yearington. Pei Yu Yu. Sarah Rose Zeev. Emily Zorfus. Graduates, please stand and face your guests in the audience. BA students, at this time, please move the tassel on your mortarboard from the right to the left. And now, I present to you the Gerald R. Ford School of Public Policy Classes of 2017. Congratulations! Wow. Well, I'll ask everyone to take their seats again for a moment. I'd like to thank all of you for coming today, and I'll ask you please to remain in your seats until the platform party and then the, class, the classes exit. We have light refreshments in the lobby, and I invite you to stay, take photographs, and enjoy the company.